All right, so today we're talking about diabetes, the sweet treat. And we have some upcoming wellness events, health screenings, wellness classes, and programs that you can participate in. And we would love for you to take advantage of these as part of your UA you know, benefit of employment. And so please do feel free uh, to take a screenshot. Also make sure that you're following us on all of our social media channels, which I'll share later. And be sure that you're getting the wellness updates via our newsletter. Ashley and Miranda and Carolyn are wellness work life, and I am just happy that I get to join them a few times a month and participate in these webinars. So they do a phenomenal job with all of the classes and programming, and we want you to take advantage of those. All right, so a couple of programs that we have offering now uh, with uh, November Diabetes Awareness Month is that we have some things called Verta Health. And VERTA is a new program that's being offered as part of your benefits that you and your insurance dependent uh, family members can utilize. And I will just give a personal story of my husband has type 2 diabetes, and he has had this diagnosis since 2007. So he's been on this journey a really long time. And he took oral medications for many, many years. And then within the last couple of years, he actually has had to take insulin and oral medications to control his diabetes. Unfortunately, it can be a disease that progresses. And so with him, he did progress because of a number of factors. And when we learned about Verta Health through UA, I thought it would be a good opportunity for him to learn more and maybe to make some changes with his health. And he participated over the summer. And in 12 weeks, you know, just his personal story, it's different for everyone. He was assigned a coach, and during that 12-week time period, he was monitored via a nurse practitioner and a physician, and then his actual family doctor was involved in his care. He was able to go from six insulin injections a day to one, from 135 units of insulin down to 30 to 40 units of insulin, and he lost 40 pounds in that 12 weeks and had really, really good outcomes. And so um, I can personally share his story as a, you know, a, a way of letting you know that this really does happen for, for actual people that we know where they sign up for this program and have good results. Again, it's not for everyone. They do a really rigorous screening process. Um, but I think it's a great program to take advantage of if it's something that you're interested in and you qualify for. And it can be something that people who just have a, you know, a, you know maybe a weight issue, a pre-diabetes diagnosis, um, maybe it's PCOS, you don't have to just strictly have type 2 diabetes. Of course, this would not be eligible for your type 1 diabetics who are insulin dependent because of, you know, your pancreas and autoimmune function, that's not going to be something, you know, that is going to be helped with Verta because you, you are insulin dependent. But for people who have type 2 diabetes, prediabetes, maybe metabolic syndrome, PCOS, it may be a good fit for you. So talk with your healthcare provider and talk to um, the folks here at Verta and see if it's a good fit for, for your care and your treatment. All right. So Another program is Lavongo. I don't have a personal story for this, but many people have seen um, some help with their diabetes management program. Also being able to get things like meters and coaching and strips and lancets. If you have diabetes or know someone who does, you know that the cost can be astronomical and there can be uh, you know, times where if you don't buy the strips with the lancets or you don't have the prescription with um, you know, everything just, you know, perfectly in alignment, then sometimes it costs you money to buy those different supplies. Um, sometimes, you know, you have to you know, get an independent prescription and it can just be a costly process. And so they do help with that type of diabetes management and there's more information here. With the Verta program, you also get a box of supplies that are shipped to you, a food scale, a digital meter to do your uh, blood pressure checks. You have an app and, and different things that go along with that. Um, recipes that are shared and you do a lot of coaching in terms of mindset and meditation work. So there's a lot that's involved, but you can do a free consultation phone call and get more information for both of these programs. 
So now let's dive into the diabetes content. Uh, my name is Abby Horton. I teach at the University of Alabama in the Capstone on College of Nursing, and I'm excited to be able to help with this type of programming. I am a registered nurse, a certified health and life coach, a Alabama ambassador for the Honors College, and your wellness class educator. If you have questions, you're welcome to reach out to me via email at abby.horton at ua.edu, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Um, the only question that I have right now in the Q&A is what is the normal keto range? And we'll talk about that kind of toward the end of the program. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark that that's answered. But again, feel free to put in the chat what brought you to the class today or what questions you might have. So the disclaimer is that this is just for educational purposes only and that nothing I share today is going to constitute medical advice. You should always contact your personal health care provider for your specific medical care needs, but I'm happy to answer questions in a more general sense at the end. And I want you to focus on what you can control, take what resonates with you and leave the rest. Baby steps are so important when you think about diabetes management or prevention. So, you know, what Laura Casey, who is a well-known uh, habit change expert says is that small progress is still progress. And please do reach out if you have questions. If I can't answer it, then we will definitely get some folks on board to help answer those questions for you. So the impact of diabetes, I like to start out with a more um, you know, general overview of diabetes and the impact that it has on everyone else in the healthcare system, because it's a problem that we're seeing more and more people younger and younger being faced with. And so in the U.S. alone, one in three Americans it will either have a diagnosis of diabetes, prediabetes, or um, they will be screened and have something called metabolic syndrome. And so that is between 30 million patients and 87 million patients, depending on the parameters that you put on that. And it costs about $242 billion in medical treatment a year. And so I think that's important for us to understand that, you know, at an individual level, diabetes can have a huge impact. And for my husband, of course, it impacts not only his health, but also it impacts me and our children. And it can lead to other, you know, longer term problems and comorbidities. And so it's important to keep a handle on that um, and to really, you know, take care of your wellness and well being, not only for yourselves, but for your loved ones. But also, it's important that we support those around us because our healthcare system is really being burdened with the care of people um, in a way that, you know, it, it's, it's costly to you and it's costly to the system. And I say that because about 9.4% of the population has diabetes. And right now we're seeing that occurring in younger and younger children. And I have a diagnosis of PCOS and I have struggled with my weight for most of my life. Um, I've recently lost about 75 pounds in the last couple of years. And for me, I know personally what it feels like to be um, fat shamed. I mean, I think that that is a real term that we can use today uh, where, you know, if you're overweight, so many things are attributed to that. And I think that in the, the way that we approach diabetes care is that unfortunately, diabetes type two is not just a weight issue. Um, we see people who have diabetes who are not overweight. And a lot of times people who have a diagnosis of diabetes it becomes harder and harder for them to manage their weight, even when they're on medication, even when they're on insulin, even when they're doing the lifestyle modifications that are recommended by their healthcare providers. So when I talk about diabetes, I think we really have to think about um, the shaming that happens because a lot of times people will say, oh, you have diabetes type one or type two. And I've seen people do that even to my husband um, because there's you know, more sympathy, I think, and there's more grace given to those with type one because it's seen as you know not their quote unquote fault, that there's nothing that they could have done to prevent it. And, and I'm not saying that, you know, that we don't have some responsibility in our health, we do. Really, that's important to say. But for the people who have type 2 diabetes, that it's not always fully within their control. And I think that's important to note um, that we shouldn't shame people, um, whether it, you know, it's type 1 or type 2, whether it's prediabetes, whether it's gestational diabetes, whether it's PCOS or some other you know, condition like metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance, is that um, we all are faced with challenges. We all have unique stressors. We all have unique 
um, lifestyles and not all of us are going to respond the same. For every one of us that are on the call, if we all have diabetes, our journeys are going to look very different. And I think that is so important to say over and over and over again, because so many times we have to justify our food choices or our lifestyle choices when we have a diagnosis and we're open with that. So I hope that that serves as encouragement to you today. So about 30 million Americans have diabetes that are adult Americans, so over the age of 18. 23.1 million were diagnosed in, in what we're looking at in terms of this data, and 7.2 million have been undiagnosed. Um, so there's some estimates based on what we know in terms of looking at blood work, that the blood work supports that they have diabetes, but they may not have formally received a diagnosis. So hopefully that makes sense there. And then when we look at people who have a, you know, diabetes diagnosis, a lot of times they're older than 65 years of age. But what we're seeing now is that younger and younger people, even children are having type two diagnosed um, diabetes. And typically under age 18, we would only see type one in that population. And so we have to look at our, you know, our environment, our healthcare system, our food industry. We have to look at the environmental toxins, the stress that we're under. I saw a study recently come out this week that, you know, talked about the stress of parents and how the stress of parents really impacts children and how they become um, more susceptible to um, kind of numbing out or what we would call disassociation and how that can be leading to attention issues or inattentive issues in our children that they're lacking focus because part of their coping mechanism to deal with parental stress is that they kind of zone out or numb out. And so I can tell you that, you know, that we have stress as adults and that we have stress as parents. I have young children and they do have, you know, that kind of impact when we have stress, but I think sometimes we don't realize how that's really impacting them and their development. And so that could be part of the conversation we have about diabetes developing earlier and earlier. We know that it has some stress components, but it has some inflammation components to it. So um, 84.1 million Americans over age 18 also could be considered pre-diabetic. And that's important to note. And then diabetes itself, just as the diagnosis, is the seventh leading cause of death. And um, that does not take into consideration the fact that if you have diabetes, you're more likely to develop cardiovascular disease, um, you know, risk for stroke, which is under that umbrella, and then also dementia, especially vascular dementia. And, you know, new research is showing maybe even uh, Alzheimer's. So it's important to know the facts. But I don't want you to be discouraged by them because what we're going to talk about is how we can really think about controlling our personal risk factors and hopefully making this better for everyone. So Alabama certainly has a lot of challenges when it comes to our health and wellness. Um, there's a lot of you know, health care disparities in our state, and we have to address that at a state level, but also at the individual level. And so, you know, things like a high premature death rate, high prevalence of chronic multiple conditions, a high prevalence of smoking and other tobacco products. You know, we don't even go into illicit, you know, drug use here, but certainly that is an issue. We have a high rate of using opioids and narcotics in our state and prescribing those. Um, to people. We've got occupational issues, mental health issues. Our, you know, teen birth rate is really pretty high. We've got frequent mental health distress that's documented. And then diabetes, you know, we see that our rates are pretty high, even for the Southeast, where they tend to be higher than the national average. And so just some challenges that Alabama has that we ought to be, you know, kind of cognizant of as we think about, you know, diabetes does not exist in a silo. There's usually other things going on. And I put this graphic here to help illustrate where we are in terms of, you know, comparing ourselves nationally to our neighboring states. And because we do like fried food, because we tend to be less active physically, and, uh, you know, we have other risk factors that, you know, put us at a disadvantage sometimes, we are in the darker red where we have more than 12% of that population having a diagnosis of diabetes as of 2017. And that is some of the most recent data that we have. I think we'll likely see that some of our numbers don't get updated, uh, you know, as on time as they typically would because of COVID. Sometimes the, the research was a little stalled 
while healthcare workers and researchers were working on the COVID-19 pandemic. And so just know that these are the most recent numbers to date. And we're anywhere from 12 to 14% of adults in Alabama having diabetes. Uh, and it's about 37% estimated that we have prediabetes in the adult population in Alabama. And so this is impacting a lot of us. Um, you know, if it's not us, probably a, a family member or a neighbor or a coworker or a friend. And so diabetes is really just defined as increased sugar circulating in the blood. And we also call this hyperglycemia. And so it's measured by the blood glucose, which can fluctuate. You know, you can do a venipuncture, so that just the finger stuck. Um, but also we can do blood work that looks at our overall last 90 days of uh, blood sugar level, which is called the HGA1C. And that's looking at your hemoglobin blood sugar levels. And so that's usually done uh, at least within a 90 day to 120 day time frame, And that's considered the gold standard for diagnosing diabetes. And so risk factors for type 2 diabetes will be things like obesity, uh, your age. So being over age 45 puts you at an increased likelihood of the diagnosis, along with the other risk factors that we're talking about. Your family history, history of having high blood pressure, high cholesterol, a history of gestational diabetes, even if that resolved after the pregnancy, being physically inactive, a history of cardiovascular issues like heart disease and stroke, history of depression and history of polycystic ovarian syndrome, insulin resistance or metabolic syndrome, which is a combination of several of these other uh, conditions. And so normal blood sugar levels, when you look at fasting two hours after your meals and then your HbA1c, these are some good graphics for you to you know take a good screenshot. We also have the slides. So Ashley will share those a little bit later in the presentation so that y'all can grab those and download them. But this is a good one to remember, you know, with a fasting blood sugar, we like to see that it's less than 100. And usually the, you know, lower end of the range is going to be 70. And so uh, 70 to 99 is going to be a quote unquote normal range for someone without diabetes who, who's fasting. Um, so that would be my normal range. But for example, my husband, it would be more normal for him because he is officially diagnosed with diabetes to be between 80 and 130. And so that's important to note that we have different normals based on if we have diabetes or not. Two hours after a meal, we want it to be less than 140. So you can see spikes in your blood sugar, particularly if you monitor it. Uh, and But we want those spikes to stay, you know, pretty low it can, in terms of we don't want it going really high over 140 and then less than 180 after meals for those with a diagnosis of diabetes and then your HbA1c we want it to be less than 5.7 for a person without diabetes and we want it to be less than 7 um, for those with the diagnosis and so I think that that's important to know. And someone put in the chat uh, or in the Q&A here, how do you get the HbA1c tested? Is that a standard blood test at a yearly exam? It depends on your provider, whether that's considered standard or not. For people who have a high risk of diabetes, it might be something that's regularly, you know, routinely ordered for you once a year with your yearly exam. Uh, but if it's not, you'll want to ask them if they're testing for that. I always think it's a good idea to ask the, the provider what they're testing for and what they're looking for with that. Uh, and for me, I can tell you personally that when I go for my yearly exams or I go for checkups, they don't always order the same test every year. They look at previous blood work to make that determination. So even for a physician, even for an individual, what's ordered at a yearly exam may likely fluctuate based on what's going on with your health at that time. And so it's never wrong to ask for that. Sometimes our blood work tests can be expensive. And so, um, you know, they have to go based on the parameters of what your insurance will cover. And sometimes your insurance won't cover a test unless you have risk factors or, uh, you know, it might only cover it if you have it every year. Um, for something like vitamin D, uh, for me, when I go and get my vitamin D tested, if I get it fr more frequently than twice a year, then I have to pay out of pocket for it. And so that's just something to consider, but you definitely can ask for it. And it is considered a standard test. It just may not be routinely ordered. Great question. Thank you.
All right, I'm going to close that out and go to the next slide. So prediabetes, like I said, about 87 million Americans are impacted, and it just means that your blood sugar levels are elevated above the normal, but they're not elevated consistently enough or high enough to be considered diabetes type 2. Um, but you can start to have long-term damage to the body and to the blood vessels, even with prediabetes. And so it's important that you catch that early and that you start to take steps to modify your lifestyle habits so that you can perhaps reverse those early signs and symptoms and early stages of, you know, diabetes, prediabetes. So if you hear that you're prediabetic, then, you know, work with your healthcare provider but it's usually recommended that you make those lifestyle changes, things like exercising, uh, you know, every week, three to four times a week at a minimum for usually 20 to 30 minutes. And we'll talk more about those recommendations, but you always want to consult your physician, your provider first so that they're monitoring you, um, especially for people who are taking insulin and blood sugar medication orally or any other form. Anytime you make a lifestyle change, that's great, but you have to make sure that you're monitoring that with your provider so that they can make adjustments if needed to your medications. And um, for my husband, he was losing weight so rapidly over the summer that we had to really closely monitor his blood sugars and reduce his insulin and oral medications pretty rapidly because he was getting low blood sugars and bottoming out because his blood sugar, you know, was, was reducing because of the good changes he was making, but then that's scary. That's dangerous when your blood sugar drops. Um, you actually have a lot more wiggle room and margin when you have a high blood sugar. You know, at 300 blood sugar, you've got more room to act than if your blood sugar is bottoming out and it's in the 50s and 60s, which is what his was doing. So please, before you make any changes, you reach out to your healthcare provider so that they can know and they can look at what you need personally in terms of your medication adjustments. So diabetes type 1, insulin-dependent diabetes, also sometimes known as juvenile diabetes. We are seeing more people, especially in their early 20s, who are being diagnosed with diabetes um, later in life. We used to see that happen more like under 12 you know, years of old or 13 years old, where they were being diagnosed in early childhood. Now we're seeing it in the late teens and early 20s where it truly is type one and it is that autoimmune reaction. And so it may be that other folks are, you know, having some type of event that's triggering that autoimmune response. Um, so it's important to always screen and make sure that you're making the correct diagnosis. And it can't be, just be done by weight alone. It has to be done with looking at antibodies and things like that. So. Um, you know, I think, again, it goes back to, we imagine that if you look thin, that you're healthy, um, and that's not always the same, that we can't equate thinness with health. I've noticed the past year that if I don't eat some sort of protein for breakfast or lunch, I randomly get shaky, jittery, almost dizzy feeling. Once I eat a snack, I feel better. Would this be a sign of becoming diabetic? Okay, so that was an anonymous question that was asked. And what I would say is that it's a sign that you are needing to have some evaluation. So I would reach out to your primary care provider and just let them know that you're having those symptoms and that you would like to have some screening done, um, see what they felt feel is appropriate. Um, I will say that, you know, if you're not eating a complex carbohydrate, a protein and a healthy fat at every snack and meal, that people will become jittery and shaky because your blood sugar does dropping gets low. And a lot of times we think about hypoglycemia, which is meaning that your blood sugar is too low. And we think about that that's kind of separate from diabetes, but that can be an early sign that you are developing diabetes because you are having some blood sugar fluctuations that are pretty extreme. Now, I don't know about your particular situation, so I can't say for sure, um, but it would just be a sign to me to kind of monitor that, to check it, to check in with your healthcare provider, let them know, uh, and then let them give you some good feedback on what you should be doing in terms of your dietary needs. We also have registered dietitians that you can see here at the university who are a great resource. I've used them personally. Suzanne Henson is the registered dietitian who's designated for faculty staff. And I've personally gone to her for a one-to-one -one consultation on my own needs. I'm a nurse and I'm a certified health and life coach, but you know, even we need someone supporting us when we're making changes and adjustments because you know, we can't always see what may be clear to someone else, even if we might have the expertise. 
And so what I would really encourage is that you, you know, think about having, you know, a good source of protein, a good source of fat, a good complex carb that's going to be a little bit harder for your body to break down. It's not a simple sugar like a donut that's going to make you feel, you know, really what I call blood sugary after eating it. And um, usually, you know, having something on hand like that is really important. Things like for people who have diabetes or prediabetes, maybe even ask your provider about having glucose tabs on hand. That's something that once my husband went on insulin, we carry with us so that he has a glucose tab that he can take. And that's going to be able to get some, you know, blood sugar going for him when maybe he's not able to fully eat something. Um, that's an important thing to consider because you don't want to have those drops. Um, with diabetes type two, not insulin dependent diabetics, you know, I say that because that's what our literature says, but again, you can become dependent on insulin as your disease progresses if you're type two. And I think that that's a misnomer. That's something that people often don't know. And adult onset diabetes, meaning that diabetes forms later in life, again, we're seeing that that's not truly the case anymore because we have earlier and earlier instances of children developing type two. And that usually is more of an issue with environment stress and, um, you know, associated with being overweight or obese. And then advanced diabetes can lead to insulin dependence later on. And so type one versus type two, this is what we typically say about that. Uh, you know, again, everything is going to be very bio-individual, but the type two diabetic will produce insulin, but sometimes it gets to the point where um, you, you become so insulin resistant that medication alone and lifestyle modifications alone will not um, be enough during certain points of your disease progression. Um, now, you know, that doesn't mean that, that can't happen. It doesn't mean that you can't do some reversal. It doesn't mean that you can't make strides in that because certainly um, my husband saw really great benefit from being able to reduce his insulin. Uh, and and it, that's a difficult thing to do. So he's a success story. Uh, so I want you to walk away from this presentation with hope, knowing that you're in control of your health and that you can make a difference, even if it feels like, you know, you've lost that hope, which is something that he felt when he was going into the VERTA program. We also have gestational diabetes, and this is what develops during pregnancy. A lot of times, uh, you know, there are some hormonal things going on in our bodies. There are some you know, autoimmune things that go on our bodies, especially when we're carrying babies, because our autoimmune system and our immune system has to respond to there being a baby on board that is not 100% our DNA. Um, our, uh, our immune system has to kind of dampen its response, which is why we tend to get sick when we're pregnant, because we're carrying a baby that, you know, we don't want our immune system attacking. And so within that process, sometimes we do develop gestational diabetes or just unstable blood sugars. And part of that is just the growth of, of growing a baby. And part of that can be that there's something more going on, like an autoimmune response or having um, hormonal fluctuations that are really putting at risk. Sometimes I think it also is that maybe you haven't been monitored closely before and you were already developing prediabetes or diabetes and you just didn't know, but because of the intense monitoring of the pregnancy, you then find out. Um, one of the biggest risk factors to the baby is that the baby can be larger in size, so maybe over nine pounds or greater, and then that becomes a challenge for being able to have a vaginal delivery um, that can become issues, you know, for the baby when the baby's born, that they can have unstable blood sugar. So the baby's blood sugar will be monitored closely. Um, sometimes that they're taken for observation after they're born to make sure that their temperature is regulating, that their um, blood sugar is stable, and that there's no other signs that there's, you know, you know, challenges or things like that. Again, that is a precaution. That's not to say that you're going to have issues. Um, or that your baby is going to have issues, but it's just something that we look out for. And um, I do have children, but you know, gestational diabetes and and the kind of effects of that on newborns is not my specialty. So I'm giving you a really broad overview there. It's just something to keep in mind. And you will be monitored closely if you are diagnosed with diabetes. You usually have a screening in the second or third trimester, depending on your risk factors and depending on your own physician, um, but it's something that you can monitor well. And a lot of times it does resolve after 
you deliver the baby. And so you just keep a check on your blood sugars and that of your baby after um, you've delivered. And, and usually you're going to see some improvement there. Sometimes though, it does develop into full-blown type 2 diabetes and you're going to get referrals and information about that if that Im impacts you. So with metabolic syndrome or any you know, disorder like PCOS or insulin resistant conditions, it's a cluster of conditions that occur together and it increases your risk of developing heart disease and stroke, so cardiovascular issues and type 2 diabetes. So these things are anything from blood pressure being high to high blood sugar to excess abdominal fat or fat around our waist and, you know, fat around your waist or adipose tissue is what we call it in the medical world, um, puts you at a higher risk because you're having extra layers of adipose tissue or fat tissue that's surrounding the organs in your body. And so that's why it is more of a risk factor because, you know, you're not having that same impact if you're carrying your weight in your hips or in your buttocks or in your lower legs or in your upper body in terms of like your limbs, like your arms or things. But if it's in your you know abdominal area, your core area, then that extra layer of fat or adipose tissue is going to be putting pressure and extra weight on the organs. And that's why that's more of a risk factor. You also could have abnormal cholesterol, so elevated cholesterol levels or high triglycerides. Those are all going to be things that could be considered a metabolic syndrome if you have you know, more than two or three of those together. And then you have risk factors for that, like being overweight, obese, uh, your age, your ethnicity or heredity, uh, simply because of like, you know, some genetic predispositions, but also maybe it's that environmental factor, or it could be, you know, that maybe you're eating a certain type of food that puts you more at a susceptibility for developing that. And then if you have diabetes, you're more likely to have metabolic syndrome, and then you can have other diseases like fatty liver disease, PCOS, and sleep apnea also play a role. And these play a role because of the high insulin, but also high inflammation. And so if you can do things to limit your inflammation, eating a low inflammatory diet um, where you don't eat processed foods or um, you're not eating a lot of you know, sugar or you know, simple carbs, those are going to be things that can really help you. And then this is what metabolic syndrome looks like in terms of putting all of those pieces of the puzzle together. So hypertension, so that high blood pressure diagnosis, high triglycerides, low HDL cholesterol, visceral obesity, meaning that that, you know, adipose tissue, that fat tissue is around your abdomen area, and then the insulin resistance leads to that metabolic syndrome. And, you know, I like to say this is that hypertension is the official diagnosis of high blood pressure because you can have high blood pressure. If all of you had a stressful event at work today, I would imagine all of you would have high blood pressure, but it's a reading of three or more sustained high blood pressures that's going to lead to the hypertension diagnosis. So if you're not going regularly to your doctor to get checked, it might be you know, three years before they notice that you have had three readings of high blood pressure. Now, if you get a high blood pressure reading, you would expect that you would come back in, you know, three months or six months to have a check on that, depending on how high it is. Uh, four years ago, I was in graduate school and was having a lot of stress and a lot of headaches. And I went to the doctor, I left work and was having a you know really bad headache and just didn't feel well. I hadn't gotten someone to take my blood pressure and it was high. And when I got to the doctor's office, I was having stroke level high blood pressures in my early 30s. And so I left that day with a prescription. That was not a case where you came back and monitored it. I left with a prescription. And it took four years that last year I was able to actually after my weight loss and other changes that I made, I was actually able to wean off of my uh, blood pressure medication under the supervision of my doctor, which does not happen often. And so again, I'm sharing that story to say that, you know, while it may take some work, it was four years of work and some people would have given up that I was really, you know, determined that I wanted to be healthier and I wanted to make those choices. And so that doesn't mean that you're going to work hard and always get the outcome you want, but I want to give you some hope that it's worth trying. And, and for me, it was worth that to, to go through that four-year process of weaning off. So 
So again, the message of today is hope. Uh, metabolic syndrome prevention. So a lifelong commitment to healthy lifestyle is what's really needed. And no matter what you're facing in terms of a diagnosis or a change that you want to make. So getting at least 30 minutes of physical activity most days, y'all, I'm telling you, this does not have to be expensive. It does not have to be a fancy gym workout. It does not have to be CrossFit or Pure Bar or Orange Theory. This could be dancing with your kids in the kitchen. It could be playing, you know, basketball in your yard with the neighbor kids. It could be, you know, walking with your grandkids after dinner. 30 minutes of physical activity is so important. And it's so important that you make it as fun and as cheap or free and easy as you can. It does not have to be something that, you know, feels grand. It should not feel grand when you work out. It should feel like the simplest thing because that's going to be what's sustainable. And I hope that you hear my passion today. Um, my passion has really been renewed for this because for so long, you know, I tell people that, you know, knowledge does not equal habit change. You can have the knowledge of doing this stuff, but if you don't do it every day, then, then the knowledge didn't change your habits. And so I can teach this every day, but if I don't live it myself, then, then it, that knowledge doesn't help me. And so I want to inspire you that any action toward a healthier lifestyle is better than no action. And, um, and I truly believe that it's the basis of everything great that you want to do in your life. Um, eating plenty of fruits and vegetables, lean proteins, you know, healthy fats, whole grains. And for me personally, I have a condition that makes it difficult for me to process, uh, you know, additives and, you know, different vitamins and things that are synthetic. And so I try to avoid anything that has enriched flour for me personally. And um, that is something that has been diagnosed with me. And so I try to look for unenriched flours um, in, in different grains. I try to look for things that are gluten-free for me personally. You may do fine with that, but I have been diagnosed with a, a condition that does not allow me to process that. So that may be something to talk to your doctor about if you're having a lot of, you know, GI issues like stomach issues after you eat gluten and dairy. And there are about seven things that are really high inflammatory rates for people. Things like soy, potentially dairy, gluten, um, some seed oils. Uh, you've got things like, um, you know, uh, just that are very hard for people to process and and you may be fine but your spouse may not be or you know you may not be able to eat it but your neighbor can so I want us to really kind of get away from saying that something is healthy for example broccoli broccoli would be considered a healthy food but if you have a GI disorder or you have um, diverticulitis where your colon and your stomach and everything is inflamed then eating cruciferous vegetables like broccoli isn't healthy for you. It's actually going to probably make you sick and you're not going to feel good. And so instead of saying that pizza is bad or broccoli is, you know, good and healthy, I think we have to really think about, is it healthy for me? And that's where working with a registered dietitian, nutritionist, you know, having a good relationship with your healthcare provider can be super helpful in you figuring out what works for you. And for people who have trouble losing weight, there's likely going to be some kind of food sensitivity or something going on. Because if you've restricted calories, if you've exercised and you get inflamed and puffy and you still can't lose the weight, there's something else likely going on. And that was my story for 20 years. I started on diets when I was 12 years old. I did every diet that was out there, every fad from slim fast to Weight Watchers to all the things. And all of those things can work. All of those diets and plans can work, uh, but if you're unhealthy or you have a food sensitivity or you have a medical condition, then you're going to need extra support because simple calorie restriction and exercise may actually lead to more inflammation and actually may make it even harder for you to exercise. When I added calories back to my diet and when I um, started walking instead of over-exercising, that's when I started to make a huge change. Um, so maintaining a healthy weight is not easy, but it's definitely something worth pursuing. And then, of course, not using, you know, nicotine, baits, you know, not smoking, not losing you know, illicit substances, not overindulging in alcohol. Alcohol is really 
um, you know, not a healthy thing for our brains or our bodies, and it causes a lot of inflammation. And so being really cognizant about your consumption, um, you know, there are some new recommendations out about how much you should drink per day based on female or male. Um, and so, you know, again, there is really no safe, you know, determination of, of alcohol consumption. So just do that mindfully. And um, it, notice if you're kind of numbing out with alcohol, if that is becoming a treat, just notice if that's a challenge for you. Same thing with carbs. That's my guilty pleasure. I love carbs and coffee. I have to really check myself on that. Um, you know, it might be social media or it might be a combination of all of that. But if you're struggling with your health, then you're probably trying to find a way um, to alleviate some of the stress of that, some of the real pain of that. And so kind of look at those habits too. Uh, again, with diabetes, early symptoms are going to be things like increased thirst and hunger and urination, and I put the medical terms for that there. You may even have frequent UTIs, um, which is not uncommon at all. I mean, that's, that is a sign that there could be something going on. You could have dry mouth, unexplained weight loss, or weight gain, depending on what's going on with you, fatigue, blurred vision, and headaches. Um, but the three in red are known as the three P's, and that's something that you may hear about because those are pretty um, indicative that you have something going on, at least with your endocrine system, which is kind of encompassing all of that we're talking about today. Major diabetes complications, y'all probably know about these. I don't like to talk about the problems more than the solutions. And so just know that there are things that you're going to have to make sure that you monitor, especially things like good foot care um, and infections, because you're more at risk for developing infections and developing complications from infections. You've got your cardiovascular health. You know, you've got to make sure that you're getting good eye checks because you can develop cataracts and glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy. Um, you can develop kidney issues um, and then issues with uh, neuropathy and peripheral artery disease in your legs. So you should be aware of that, but you should be working closely with a provider to help you manage those, you know, complications and symptoms as best as you can, because that can sometimes feel like a part-time job or even a full-time job. And then over time, you want to make sure that you're not causing damage to um, cardiovascular health with high blood sugars. So things like having diabetes and high cholesterol really compounds your risk for things like cardiovascular symptoms and the things that I mentioned on the previous slide. And so a lot of times people will say, oh, you know, your blood pressure is high, your blood sugar is high. Oh, and you know, you're, oh, it looks like your cholesterol is high as if that is kind of a surprise. Um, but it's not a surprise because it's how the body works together. Usually if you have, you know, high blood sugar, you're going to have high, you know, blood pressure and high cholesterol at some point. So those three things being high is really a, a matter of inflammation and how the body works. And if that interests you, I have a talk on cardiovascular health. Uh, that's posted on the archive webinars at wellness.ua.eu. It's one of my very favorites to talk about cardiovascular health and really about cholesterol and some of the myths around cholesterol. So be sure to check that out if you're interested. But your neurological system also can have some nerve damage and that's all of the neuropathies that we mentioned. So if you're having a tingling sensation or altered pain response in your body, that might be a sign I just want to mention some of these things in case you do have a diabetes diagnosis, you kind of know what to look for. That can feel like pain and burning and tingling or a numbness of the feet and lower legs. Um, my husband says that sometimes it almost feels like you're getting like a, a little electrical, you know, shock to you sometimes. Um, you also can develop something called Raynaud syndrome where your hands lose some of the color and they become blue and it can be really painful when you wash your hands especially during the winter time or when you're outside, that can be really painful. And that can be associated with diabetes. Your immune system, like I mentioned, can actually um, you know, have some weakening because of the extra blood sugar. Um, people you know, have posted videos of you know, looking at extra blood sugar in your blood and likened it to taking a, a smoothie straw and trying to um, you know, take honey or sugar water and suck that through the straw versus just trying to suck pure water. And if you think about it like that, that really makes sense why having extra blood sugar in your blood would uh, make it difficult because it makes everything sticky and hard to move. 
And that's why it's impacting your cardiovascular system. It just makes it very sludgy and, and kind of very thick or viscous. And so you can have foot infections, yeast infections, urinary tract infections, and you can have other infections like surgical side infections or infections within your body that it's difficult to heal. And so the sweet truth is that you can make lifestyle changes to improve your overall health. And I think that's so important to remain hopeful about because you don't want to just simply accept your diagnosis and then um, not feel as if you have control over your future health. And so hopefully that's going to be uh, an inspiration for you today to just make one small change. So prevention is always best, but it's not always possible. And I want to acknowledge that I'm not able to prevent 100% of the health problems that I've had, even though I have knowledge and I'm going to my physician. Uh, it's just sometimes that's not how life works. And, and that's unfortunate. But I want you to know that you can make choices that make it better. So nourishing your body, becoming more active, but getting plenty of sleep and rest. Rest and sleep are not the same thing. So resting during the day is so important, not just, you know, and I know we all work, right? It's not like you can take your nap mat out after lunch and take a nap. So I want to recognize and be really, you know, aware that this is not, not always easy, but it's worth it. So resting might be that you get up every hour for five minutes and you go to the restroom and you will refill your water bottle and you take a lap around your building or a lap outside if it's pretty outside. And that can be rest. Uh, putting your phone down, that can be restful. Silencing some of your notifications on your computer, that can be a source of rest. Taking your medications and your treatments, excuse me, as directed by your provider, just taking care of your body in general. So, you know, nourishing your body with good foods and then taking care of your body in the sense that when you know that you're tired, don't push yourself. That's something that I really have to personally work on. Avoiding tobacco products, illicit drugs, um, you know, overuse of alcohol, that's going to really help your body. The less toxins that you put in, um, the more likely your body can heal and repair itself. And when you have diabetes or high blood sugar, it's having to do a lot of repair work. Um, keep your routine medical appointments. It's so easy to prioritize, you know, work or your kids or other people that are important to you, but keep those medical appointments. Monitor your blood sugar and your blood pressure and your cholesterol. Uh, manage your stress. And that is easier said than done. And then other lifestyle changes that you can think about. Um, you know, knowing your numbers is what we always say in nursing. If you know your numbers and you know your risk factors, then you can take steps to really improve those. Um, so things like yoga, meditation, eating good fruits and vegetables. We've got the wellness basics class that you can look at. You know, it's we what we call the five to thrive. It's sleep and nourishment and it's meditation and it's movement and it's hydration. You know, so much of what we need to do with a diabetes diagnosis is make sure that we're hydrating well. And that's going to help get that blood sugar moving and make that blood sugar be less sticky and, and thick. So other things that you can do, focus on your health and wellness, not just your diagnosis, um, it's not just about managing your blood sugar, but it's also about managing the complications around that. Stress contributes to your health issues, um, you know, exercise and daily movement every day. Again, it doesn't have to be a fancy gym membership. It could be that you're uh, dancing or walking or swimming or something like that. And those things are going to be lower impact and cause less stress on the body. And it's going to cause less, you know, inflammation probably overall for you than if you're running or um, you know, lifting heavy weights in a really quick way. I think weightlifting is very good, but sometimes we want to just run. We think running is the best exercise and it's not always the best for um, people with chronic health conditions. Walking is great. Swimming is great. Yoga can be really helpful. So, you know, that's something to consider. You want to just not diet, but make healthier food choices overall. So avoiding things like trans fats and added sugars, and in my cardiovascular health talk, I go more into that. Uh, use your blood sugar monitor regularly. Uh, get your you know, regular checkups with your healthcare team. Seek out mental health care if needed. That can be especially important. Uh, diabetes diagnosis, we don't think about mental health being a huge you know, factor of that, but it does take a toll when you've had that condition for a long period of time or you're having complications, even though you're working really hard to be healthy. It can take its toll on your mental health. Customize your wellness plan to fit your goals and your own needs. 
and then really create a group or community that can help support you and help hold you accountable. And usually that's better if it's not your immediate friend group or your, you know, your spouse or the people that you live with, because sometimes that can be difficult. But having a group of people who are going through similar challenges can be helpful. And these are the wellness basics that I mentioned. Uh, I think it's so important that we focus on hydration. I think that's the easiest thing to change. Sleep is harder to control. Uh, it's harder to make your brain go to sleep at night, but you can control how much water you drink and you can control more so the food that you put in your body. And then meditation is really about taking those brain breaks, you know, three to five minutes a day, work up to 15 minutes a day, three times, you know, a day. So 15 minutes in the morning, in the afternoon, and then again in the evening for meditation, for music, for dancing, just for something that lets your brain take a break. And definitely unplug from technology as much as you can. Here's some things on nutrition. Again, these are going to be very broad because, um, you know, we're thinking of, you know, what is best for most people, but a dietitian can really help you with individualized goals. So thinking about having a lot of fruits and vegetables, particularly non-starchy vegetables as being about half of your plate. Um, things like adding full fiber carbohydrates, things like, you know, kiwi or you know a sweet potato um, and then you want to have a lean protein a serving of fruit can be helpful especially if you're going to have you know carbs and fruit having those earlier in the day can be helpful sometimes and then choosing healthy fats things like butter and and avocado that can be helpful and then completing your meal making sure that you have something that's low calorie like water or unsweetened tea or occasionally coffee can be really helpful to the body if you're making sure that you're getting a good clean source of coffee. Coffee sometimes can have a high fungal content, mold content. Uh, same thing with peanuts. That can really be what's contributing to a lot of allergies and GI issues. And so um, looking for clean organic sources of coffee are important. So the goal is really a lean protein, a full fiber carb, a healthy fat at every meal to make it a healthy meal. And then eating the rainbow. Sometimes when we want to be healthy, we eat a lot of green food. Otherwise, we eat a lot of beige or brown food. And so you want to make sure that you're getting all the colors of the rainbow because those represent different uh, you know, minerals and nutrients and antioxidants that one color might offer, but another color might not. And so that's important. Tracking what you're eating and doing is also important to see the progression of how far you've come and making a, you know, one healthy change at a time. We can get overwhelmed with a lot of the choices that we have. Here are some sources of protein. And again, we're going to share this PowerPoint so you don't have to copy all of this down. But here's some protein sources that would be good for you. And you can do this even if you have, you know, a flexitarian diet. Maybe you're a vegan or vegetarian. So this can work for many different dietary needs and restrictions. Maybe you have celiac or you, um, you know, have a um, religious need, maybe some of the foods you can't eat because of your religious background. So definitely it can be all inclusive and, and helpful to anyone. So you just make your choices based on what fits for your lifestyle. Some complex carbs that you can consider. I think these are great. Sweet potatoes and plantains are my favorite. They don't feel like, um, you know, you're missing out on anything. And then non-starchy vegetables. I'm very blessed that I like vegetables oftentimes people don't but if you add some seasoning that are you know really healthy seasonings and add some butter it makes most vegetables better <laughs> so that's always a good way and you can always kind of scale back on the butter and the seasoning and the salt when I say to use salt I always choose um, Celtic sea salt or just a little bit of pink Himalayan salt uh, I typically do not use iodide um, you know infused table salt um, just for me personally so that's something to consider as well. Healthy fat options. Cheese and avocados and dark chocolate are my favorite. And then diet and exercise, even a 10% reduction in your body weight. So if you weigh, um, you know, 200 pounds, if you're drinking, you know, 100 ounces of water, about half of your body weight in ounces a day, but usually not more than 100 to 128 ounces of water, because you don't want to become overly, um, you know, water toxic or anything like that, um, a 10% reduction in your body weight, you know, losing 20 pounds would be huge in terms of your overall health. Continue your medication therapy as directed. And these are some medication options that you may be introduced to or you may be familiar with. 
And then stress management, so important to manage your stress as well as you can. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have stress. Unfortunately, that's part of the human experience, but thinking about how you're going to respond during stressful moments is very important and having some self-care strategies to help you is also important. Things like journaling, practicing gratitude, uh, meditation, those are my three favorites for stress management. And I'm just gonna say, complete the stress cycle response. So if you are feeling stressed and you stay sitting in your desk chair, that's probably one of the worst things that you can do just because you don't complete the stress response. You're supposed to get up and move and do something and then come back and sit down. That may not be exercise in the middle of the day, but it may be that you just go for a brisk walk around your building and come back. You will notice that you feel so much better after you move your body if you feel stressed. Monitor your blood sugar. We say sometimes up to six times a day, especially when you're newly diabetic or you're going through a, a season of life where your blood sugars are not stable. So tracking your blood sugar and your symptoms and what you're eating, that can be really helpful for your provider to make changes to your diet and your lifestyle. And then these are some recommendations about how often to check. If you do have a diagnosis of diabetes, you're gonna get a personalized um, plan for this. I just like to throw this in here just for educational purposes. And then there's a book called Master Your Diabetes that I think is a great read. Uh, certainly I don't support everything that's in the book, but I think it is a good read for you to get an idea of how to look at diabetes management more holistically. And it is by a naturopathic doctor. So um, that is important to note, she is not a medical doctor. These are our social media channels that Ashley and Miranda and Carolyn, the whole team manage, and they do a phenomenal job with that. We would love for you to follow us there. And I'm going to leave it on this slide so that you have my contact information, but I will be happy to take questions. Or if you want to put comments or feedback in the chat, please do that as well. Good, I'm glad this was helpful. Any feedback, any comments, any questions that y'all might have? Did this cover what you expected? Was there something that you wish I had covered? In terms of keto, someone asked about the keto normal ranges. That varies based on age and based on whether you're male or female, like so many things in medicine do. And so um, for my husband personally, they told him that they wanted with his plan um, to be between one and two when he would check his blood glucose ketones. That's the other thing is that ketones also vary based on whether it's your urine ketones you're testing, whether you're doing the um, kind of almost like the breathalyzer test for ketones or whether you're doing um, the urine. So that is really hard to say this is the optimal range for ketones because it's very, very bio individual. So I would not want to give you a range. Um, but they will if you're being monitored through a medical uh, keto plan. And Verda does use a lot of keto principles. So that is going to be more what your diet looks like. Um, but I will say I watched the videos from Verda and I learned so much about health and the body that um, it was just presented in a really, really great way. Just having those modules and access, I thought was beneficial to the program and it was completely free. But yeah, just know that ketones, it's gonna, there are so many variables about that. It doesn't have a specific range that you can say like blood sugar. Good, I'm so glad. I can't overemphasize though. Please reach out to your healthcare provider. Please take advantage of our registered dietitian nutritionist here, Suzanne Henson over at UMC. Please reach out about Livongo or Verda to see if you're you know, qualified for that or your loved ones on your insurance plan. There are so many great resources out there and this was just for educational purposes, but I hope it was helpful. I hope maybe it inspired some you know, lifestyle changes that you consult with your provider about first and um, that you feel a little more hopeful. Yeah, thank you, Alan. I'm happy to share his story. If y'all have questions, you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, it is a relatively new program for the university, but not really new overall. I believe they're based out of California and it was a group of physicians that developed the Verda program. And, um, and certainly you can do a consult call with both Livongo and Verda to see what's a better fit for you. Um, but yeah, I always like to hear from, from real people that I know the experiences that they've had.
Any other last questions, comments, or anything I can help with? I know we're just at our time, but y'all are welcome to go. If you need to move on to your next thing, you've gotten your credit, so no worries there, but I wanna make sure everyone's got their questions answered. All right, well, y'all have my email here. It's abbyperiodhorton at ua.edu. I am more than happy to answer your questions. It really is a delight for me to be able to help reach out to y'all, provide you with resources and things, um, because on my health journey, that's what I needed. I needed someone that I could email or that I could call and, and just ask a quick question. Again, I may not know, but we'll find out the answer for you. And I wish you well on your health and wellness journey. You've got what it takes to be successful at this and to manage your health well. And um, don't let a diagnosis, uh, you know, be something that um, that that causes you to feel like you don't have control over your health and wellness. You can still be healthy and you can still make great strides in your health and wellness, um, despite the challenges that may be presented. So I hope you all have a great rest of your day and roll time. Bye, y'all.